Welcome back. Our guest is an inspiration to artists, writers, and nerds everywhere. And first of all, I'd like to say that with, without ever having met me, you are a major influence on my life as my father was a fan of yours and you inspired him to learn how to draw. So we'll start with our standard question. Who are you, what to do, and why? Uh, my name's Jeff D. I am an artist and game designer, primarily in the field of tabletop role-playing games. Um, that's who, that's what, and why is because I don't seem to be able to stop myself. <laughs> uh, you'd be surprised how common that response is. Uh, so Dungeons and Dragons has benefited from a resurgence in popularity due to shows like Stranger Things and Big Bang Theory and the interest in so-called nerd culture. Uh, what's your take on this new interest in an over 40-year-old game? Um... Well, uh, as someone who's gone on to make uh, RPGs of my own, uh, I, I'm always hopeful that some of that will spill over into, uh, into attention for my more recent work, but that's, uh, that's a hope. Um, I'm glad that, uh, that the hobby is catching on. I think it's, it's great. I'm, um, I'm thrilled to have been born just in time to see this completely new kind of game emerge as a thing. I mean, uh, in the entire history of the human race, there have been board games and dice games and card games and things, but never role-playing games. That just started in the early 70s. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy whenever I see that uh, that hobby get attention and continue to grow. You were in your teens when all this started, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's oh. right. Uh, okay. I was in I was in high school and uh, grew up in a small town, about a half hour drive south across the border from uh, from Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, which is where TSR was, uh, the original Dungeons and Dragons publishers. My eldest brother discovered D and D first, and I can still very clearly remember the day when I went with my mom to go pick up my brother from his gaming club, and there was a group of kids sitting around a a, a table. This was in their like, uh, um, like screened in front porch area, and they had a they had a table set up. There was a kid at one end behind a ref screen and there were miniatures and a grid on top and they had dice and character sheets and stuff. Pretty much exactly what role-playing game uh, gatherings look like to this day. Uh, and I go, what you doing? And um, got myself invited to the next meeting of his club because this sounded so cool, right? But they didn't play D&D &D at that next meeting. They played chain mail, which is a medieval uh, miniatures game like, you know, mass combat thing, uh, some of which was tapped into, because it was also from Gary Gygax, some of that was tapped into during the design of original Dungeons and Dragons, so there were, there are some echoes and similarities. So um, Chainmail is like the precursor to D&D. Yeah, kinda. I mean, it's, it's not quite that direct, I don't think. Um, but they, they gave me uh, one night and uh, a little unit of skirmishers to be in charge of, and I promptly got them all killed and then <laughs> rode my, my one remaining figure, my knight, into the orc castle and was role-playing my guts out in the context of a game where it re that isn't really what you're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> that so that yeah. seems like the best role-playing comes when everything went wrong. <laughs> I remember trying to explain to, before that incident. Tried to explain to my my best friend um, what role playing games were, and I drew a dungeon map and walked him through it. But we didn't have any rules or anything, and I'd never actually seen it done. So what I came up with wasn't a traditional dungeon map where you know it's like one floor of the dungeon per sheet. I did a cutaway drawing with. You know, each corridor stacked directly on top of the other and stairways going down and things, right? A side view, uh, which isn't right, but that's how excited I was about 
about the idea of of playing through adventures from a first person perspective um with in in a much more immersive way than you know you, you can find in any other kind of game that had ever existed before uh, would that uh, high school friend happen to have been uh, Jack Herman, uh, the one you worked on? When Actually, we I don't think play? it was yet. Oh. I think it was somebody else um, who didn't go into gaming. Uh, Jack and I met uh, it, when we were both going to the same high school and we both signed up to work in the library. So we would go, you know, you take the cart full of returned books back into the stacks to put them away that was the job right and he and i would go back there and like you know goof on the latest episodes of monty python's flying circus and um uh <laughs> and things like that and he you know he got me uh, interested in hp lovecraft we actually had lovecraft books in our high school library which was creepy uh and uh you know talking about things and he his uh, a friend of his who I've never met did illustrations that appeared in original Dungeons and Dragons. Oh. Uh, so that that's a weird kind of connection. So we we hit it off and uh, and started gaming. Hmm. All right. And you you two created the uh, Villains of Vigilantes role playing game, which is now on I believe its third iteration, uh, the Mighty Protectors. Yeah. And I understand. Uh, please confirm this. I understand that the game came about after a debate over who would win in a fight, Spider-Man or the Human Torch. That is exactly right. Which is odd that that was the debate, since uh, Jack is more of a DC fan and I'm more of a Marvel fan. And so I would, it, it, I'm looking back on it, I'm surprised it wasn't like you know Batman versus Spider-Man or something. Right? Would have been more. Uh, appropriate. I honestly don't remember which character we each backed, but uh, it occurred to me gaming is a way you can play out conflicts between individual characters, and so I wrote up just enough rules for superpowers uh, using the one set of role-playing rules that I still had in the house, my oldest brother having taken everything else with him to college, right? Uh, I had uh, TSR's 1975, I think, role-playing game, Empire of the Petal Throne, which is D&D um, uh, inspired mechanics, but it's a completely different thing. It's the first role-playing game that ever came with a setting. And um, I used its mechanics and wrote up some superpower rules and we fought Spider-Man versus the Human Torch. And I don't remember who won. People always ask. That yeah. really wasn't the important thing. The important thing is we came away from that going, D -d -d are, is this like a thing a pe human beings are allowed to do to make a role-playing game that's like superheroes? Because it hadn't been done yet. Uh, so yeah, yes, that's how that, that started. Discussions. <laughs> Sorry? It all came about for one of those like uh, high school. Just like, hey, come on, death battle, let's do this. <laughs> so uh, I want I want to ask you more about your work on uh, Empire of the Pell Throne uh, later. Mm. But first, on the mm -hmm. Lovecraft front, I understand that you yeah. wanted to draw the Lovecraft mythos for deities and demigods, but uh, Errol Otis got to draw them. That is exactly correct. He did an, a, an excellent job, better than I would have done. It's really more up Errol's alley than mine, but that doesn't, that has no bearing on how much of a fan I was, <laughs> right? So I'd like to have, but he did great. Boy, oh, you have done your research. <laughs> yeah, I, I was prepared for this. Uh, also, <laughs> Speaking of the deities and demigods thing, your art on yeah. it was really great, especially the Elric Mythos art that, that for some reason was removed in subsequent printings. Uh, can you tell us a little about that? About the removal or about the art? Uh, both of them. Um, so uh, I, uh, I don't want to get it wrong. There was some question of where the rights to do such a thing properly resided 
and I, as I understand it, but you know, I'm really not the person to ask because I wasn't involved in the legal end of this. As I understand it, um, the, Michael Moorcock personally gave some people the rights, and then Michael Moorcock's lawyer gave some other people the rights with them not understanding that those would conflict and, um, and, the, and uh, attempts to work it out failed. And uh, so TSR had to go back and remove those things from their uh, book, which came later than the, the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. Well, it's quite a shame because I gotta say your drawings of Thor were quite awesome. I mean, oh, he's still in there. We have the rights the to Thor. Great. <laughs> uh, also, I understand that one of your first published pieces of professional art was in Dragon Magazine. So how did you get started at TSR? Well, remember, I grew up in a small town about a half hour drive south of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, in the early, early, early days of TSR. So um, I would ride with my brother up there up once a month or so and go into the, the very first incarnation of the dungeon hobby shop and see what was new. Like I remember finding Traveler, the science fiction role-playing game Traveler on the stands the very first time it had appeared uh, when that was brand new. And um, I remember the uh, being there and seeing the the, the uh, first Advanced Dungeons and Dragons book, which was the Monster Manual, when it hit the stands. And, uh, you know, I was doing art in my uh, high school newspaper and uh, drawing things for fun. And I, you know, I'm a little fanboy, so I went up there and showed my artwork to the guys behind the desk. And the uh, Dragon Magazine offices were right upstairs and they heard about me. So I got a job doing some illustrations in that, that early episode, uh, early uh, issue of the Dragon. So what were your early uh, artistic influences for your illustrations? Uh, as far as I can see, uh, your style seems to have a little bit of Neil Adams, Jim Starlin, or even some early John Byrne in it. Yeah, I would mostly say John Byrne. And actually, not so much John Byrne as Terry Austin, because it was the inking on John Byrne's stuff that I thought really made it super amazing. And he's, he's good without, right? But um, this, was the, this was during the time of Byrne and Austin on the X-Men, which is just fabulous, amazing stuff. And uh, so... Um, my inking style, I think, was very heavily influenced by him. Yeah, I can definitely see it in the, uh, the Alpha Flight comics. That's yeah. Great. So you were one of the go-to artists for the early modules of D&D, along with uh, Jim Rosloff, Errol Otis, Tim Truman, Diesel LaForce, or LaForce and Bill Willingham. So what was it like to work And Dave Sutherland. And, and uh, say it again? D Dave Sutherland. Ah, yes. So what was it like to work in that kind of creative environment? Um, it was great. Uh, the only thing I didn't like about it was the time clock. Uh, and, and it was, uh, it was, uh, TSR was starting to get big and, uh, you know, so they started to have some corporate uh, structure to the way uh, life was there. But it was a lot of, um, it was a lot of goofing around and looking at each other's work and inspiring one another. And uh, uh, I, I just, think I had a wonderful time, wonderful time. We were on one floor uh, above, by this point, the dungeon hobby shop had moved to downtown Lake Geneva and was in this corner building. And uh, uh, we were on, I think the floor above the hobby shop and then the floor above us was the uh, was the design department, and uh, so there were you know we would uh, go up and down the stairs and hang out with other people uh, doing the creative work. Uh, it was great. It was great. So you worked uh, bullpen style with the other artists, or mostly individually and just sort of wandered. Um. There, there wasn't a lot of like, uh, 
you know, actually working together on the same pieces of art, right? We each like got our assignments and then we did the things that were assigned to us. But you can find a couple. I know there's one where I think I inked something for Diesel. Um, but for the most part, it was it was inspirational uh, uh, crossing over, right? So how much uh, collaboration or camaraderie was there among the artists, either uh, officially or just occasionally? Like, oh, a, uh, a lot. And in fact, at one point there was a, uh, we were many of us, not all of us at once, but at one point many of us were roommates in a house that we rented in Lake Geneva. And so that was like pretty much constant, constant gaming uh, and then coming in and drawing and then going back and gaming more. <laughs> Sounds like a proper little family. <laughs> so while at TSR, you worked on some amazing influential books like uh, Against the Giants, uh, Scourge of the Slave Lords, and Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, and your halfling designs were especially interesting. Uh, how'd you come up with designing those? Um, um, so I, I always felt a conflict in my mind between the description of hobbits in like The Hobbit and uh, early on in Lord of the Rings, right? And these little, you know, tough thief guys that you'd play in Dungeons and Dragons. And I took my inspiration, I think, from what Marion Pippin became in the latter part of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, right? When they they actually got a little bigger and a little more muscular and a little tougher. And it was really, for me, not about halflings being chubby little guys that eat too many breakfasts anymore. Uh, though I, you know, I still threw a few of those in every once in a while just to, so people would remember, oh yeah, that's the, that's the race we're talking about. I did notice that they look kind of like little thugs as opposed to the like, being pudgy designs in uh, Tolkien. Hey, okay, I guess you can put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but actually, like that halfling design, and then also just the way they're portrayed, actually led to the creation of, or uh, led a little bit to the creation of my own D and D character, uh, Angus MacGuffin, a uh, halfling rogue that drinks and stabs stuff. <laughs> and also Scottish, right. so plenty of cursing. Fair enough. Always fun. So one of your recent projects has been your uh, uh, Belthorn rules, uh, based on M yeah. M A R Barker's Empire of the Pell Throne of uh, what was it, uh, Tecumel. Right. Uh, were you introduced to Barker's world in your TSR days, or did you discover it oh, later? Be before, before. Um, like I said, when my brother, eldest brother, went off to college, he took all of the role-playing stuff with him except for the boxed set of Empire of the Petal Throne. And, I, like, I'm still in high school at this time. And so that's what I really cut my teeth on as a GM. And... Um, I started learning whatever it is that I understand now about role-playing game design by tinkering with the mechanics in Empire of the Petal Throne more than in Dungeons and Dragons. Because um, uh, that's, I mean, that's how in the olden days there were, that was the only way to learn was to, um, find things you didn't like in published designs that you, you still wanted to use and fix them. And that process of fixing them is learning how to write the rules yourself. Seems that uh, like a lot of your career is owed to your brother taking all the, the role-playing stuff. And it seems like he's a, a large influence on your career. Sure. <laughs> In a way of accidental theft. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, what? they they didn't belong to him. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, back back to the point. Uh, what is it about uh, Tecumel that inspires your artwork? I, I noticed it's kind of like a, a oh. Mesoamerican cross with a South Asian style. Um. Well, so uh, the Tecumel setting is uh, it's it's not 
medieval fantasy. That's like the first big obvious thing everybody, everybody notices about it. It's more like, um, you know, ancient Babylon meets the Aztec empire, right? It's, it's much more primitive culturally and much more savage um, the, 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 you know, the kinds of societies they have. So, I mean, Tecumel has got, you know, the, the dark gods who will accept human sacrifice and there's, there's slavery and there's other, uh, uh, um, uh, unpleasant and, uh, adult kind of things going on there that, um, that just make it a, a darker setting. But that's not why I like it as a role-playing setting. Why I like it as a role-playing setting is because it provides a context within which all the stuff that you're used to having happen in your role-playing games can happen, right? I mean, it, no, it, in Tecumel, you don't just sit around in a tavern until you hear some rumor that there's a hole in the ground somewhere where you can go kill monsters and take their stuff. The, in, uh, in Tecumel, you know, that hole in the ground was leads to something that was built in ancient times. And the Tecumel setting goes back, you know, a hundred thousand years of prior history and six or seven different empires that have risen and fallen since humans came to the planet. And so um, dungeon crawls are archaeology on, on Tecumel because it matters who made these things and what they were up to and what what which gods they knew about at that time and so on. So so there's that, but also that hole in the ground is on a plot of land that somebody is operating uh, under the auspices of the emperor. And so they may not like you coming there and taking valuables from beneath the earth under that plot of land that they are that they control, or they may, may be the ones who hire you to go there and do that work, right? Um, also, the, the temples may, uh, various temples may lay claim to that site, that archaeological site, because the gods that are worshipped now were known in different forms in ancient times, and so if the temple of Vemukla, the fire god of war, uh, believes that the deity worshipped by the people who built, dug that hole in the ground 10,000 years ago were worshipping an earlier form of him, and then that's a holy site, and then they will lay a claim. So it's, it's dungeon crawling in all this social, political, historical context, which just makes it so much more interesting. So it's and that's like just an example of the kind of thing. So it's like the both the fun Indiana Jones style part of archaeology and then also the actual uh, socio-political parts of archaeology. Sure. All yeah. land claims and stuff. Yeah. I mean, Pro Professor Barker was a, uh, was a, a tenured professor at the University of Minnesota uh, and world traveler and linguist and... Um, a lot of his perspective as a scholar is in that game, in the the in this the design of that setting. Actually, it kind of sounds a bit like uh, what's now used in uh, Numenera, but with just a little bit more Lovecraft thrown in. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> in, people get their influences where they get them. That's fine. It's like stealing, but uh, <laughs> that's all right. It's going to be hard for anybody to put in, you know, the 30 or 40 years of work that Professor Barker put into building his setting before there even was a Dungeons and Dragons. Because his plan had been to write novels in the Tecumel setting originally, right? It, it, there, he, was a, he was a gamer in the sense that such a thing existed before D&D. In that he'd go to science fiction, fiction conventions and uh, tabletop game conventions and play great big miniatures battles. That's about what there was, right? So he had that background, but he came up with the setting with the idea that he was going to write novels about it. And he eventually did. Uh, five of the things came out over the years. 
Well, let's hear it from Barker doing it first. Yeah. Okay, so since you and I are both uh, Austin area locals, I ran into uh -huh. the game mom for one of your games at HEB one night. Uh, what role-playing games are you playing these days? Um, I am currently running a Metamorphosis Alpha campaign. Ooh. That's uh, the first science fiction game from TSR, but I'm using my Mighty Protectors game system, Villains Vigilantes 3.0 Mighty Protectors, to, uh, for the mechanics, because, you know, it's got much more, um, if, I, if I must toot my own horn, it's got much more uh, detailed and complete rules on all kinds of weird powers that you might want to give your mutants and your robots and things. Uh, so that's that's what I'm running right now. I'm also playing in um, uh, a, uh, a a Gamma World <laughs> campaign oh. run by a by a friend of mine. The he, he this is Brian Adams who wrote the upcoming World War II source book for V and V three Mighty Protectors. He's running a Gamma World campaign, also using the Mighty Protectors system for the mechanics. That that just it, that just tends to happen in gaming groups that have a designer Oops. in them. You know, the design that game that designer's designs tend to take over because it's what everybody's familiar with. Yeah, I noticed that uh, in my D and D games, uh, like we try playing occasionally with other DMs, but uh, we almost always just take it back to the house. And my dad DMs for all of us, since he really simplifies the whole thing. So. Mm -hmm. It's really all a matter of the system. So, how has your how has your tabletop gaming changed uh, during the pandemic? Because we're all in lockdown right now. Uh, we're on roll twenty these days. Oh, nice. Because right? uh, uh, that uh, it you know it's tough to uh, it was tough to make the transition because face to face you're right there and every little. You know, facial expression and uh, and and uh, and uh, snort of derision and uh, and you know grunt uh, is all right there, and because yeah, so it's the bandwidth for communicating is so much wider. But about three or four uh, sessions in, we got comfortable with Roll Twenty. Um, I'm not sure how eagerly we will transition back to face to face, to be honest. When the, when the pandemic ends. Um, there are certainly downsides, but there's also upsides. So. I imagine it's uh, very easy to, to lose focus when you're just doing it online. And probably a bit harder to share stats. It's actually easier to lose focus face to face because you've got the whole rest of the real world surrounding you to distract you. You know, um, it's, it's much less likely for two of the players to go off on an unrelated discussion about the latest episode of the boys uh, right yes, when 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 they're each waiting their turn with their headphones on to play on roll 20 around an actual gaming table that's just going to happen when it's not their turn which is you know a constant source of annoyance for the poor gm I'm sure my DM could actually really attest to that. Uh, okay, so we got a final question that we're asking uh, all the guests in the season. If you had a magic wand or a monkey's paw or a deck of many things or some other magic item that would allow you to change two things about the world, what would you change? See, I, I think when people ask questions like this, they should like pause for a moment and make sure they don't want to face the consequences if the person they're asking actually does have a magic wand or a monkey's paw because <laughs> you might you might get sorry. us you might you might motivate us to do something that might not might not be what you want uh but anyway do you have something uh, like that no I don't. <laughs> no I don't i do not in fact but someday you know maybe somebody does if i could change Reality two things about the world oh my gosh do you want this to get political because sure, sure, it's gonna yeah. get it's gonna get political immediately. Okay. Okay. Uh, I would like Donald Trump to explode painfully <laughs> and publicly and showering 
a crowd of his fans with his orange guts. Oh. And I think if I could have that, I might just take the second one on a gift certificate because uh, that would pretty much satisfy me. <laughs> Even Chris goes getting oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna explode scanner style and then get like a fifty dollar HEB gift card. <laughs> uh, anyway, I think that's well, I would, all then I would time. I would hold that I would hold that gift certificate up to the, the next fascist that wanted to try to take over the United States oh, yeah. as oh. a warning, right? <laughs> Wait, wait, so he just explodes, and then all that's left is a tiny gift certificate. And you're like, this is your fate. <laughs> a rain check for a heavy It suit. might not be a gift certificate. It might be, you know, just but some physical object to indicate that, yes, I've got the power to do something like that again if I felt like it. I'm afraid to use it. <laughs> I'm necessary evil. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I think that's probably all the time we got here today. So, Jeff D., everybody, we'll be right back. Thanks for having me.